And it is good to be with the body on a Wednesday night. It's good to be with the body every night. You know when you realize the, the reality is that we will be together always for always. It's amazing. It is a blessing. So if I can pray for this message, Lord, Father, we thank you, Lord. We praise you. Lord, thank you for, for the good, good messages of good stewardship. Lord, thank you for, for teaching us how to, how to mend our nets, how to prepare our baskets, how to soften our soil to receive the good, good seed of your blessing. Lord, we thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You know, kind of, this is our last night in the, in the Healthy Stewardship Series, and, and it's been six weeks already. So uh, just remember, next week is going to be a, um, we call, it's a worship. We like to celebrate the end of a series. So it's going to be a night of worship, and we usually order pizza. And then, uh, then we come back after that with a six-week series. I'm so excited about this. It's called A Healer, The Miracles of Jesus. Amen. And this is going to be a good series. Um, like this, this has been a good series. So we do. The elders, myself, we pray, pray, pray. We talk about where the Lord is leading us. And, and so we're not just flipping pages in a book and saying, let's talk about this. Everything is Holy Spirit assigned and ordained. So let's wrap this up. Let's get into this, to this uh, sixth message. And, and tonight's message is about giving is a blessing for healthy stewards. To give should be a blessing for healthy stewards. Blessed stewards do. We understand that giving is part of living our best blessed life. And just so, so we'll wrap this up, I want to make sure there's three types of giving that we, that we talk about. There's tithes, there's offerings, and there's extravagant offerings. Now, there's probably a better Hebrew or Greek word than extravagant, but I think the message comes across, especially in the example that I'm going to share. So just so we understand, so there's clarity, is that a tithe, a tithe, remember, is 10%. You can't negotiate it down to seven. This is not like the Fed cutting the interest rate or, or something like that. The tithe means ten, a tenth. A tithe is 10% given to the church. The, the biblical basis, the foundation for this, is the practice is rooted in Scripture, obviously, just like Malachi 3.10 and all throughout Old Testament and New Testament. It encourages believers to bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. And this is the storehouse is where you're spiritually fed, which is your local church. The purpose, tithes are just in a practical way. They're used to support the church's operations and the ministries and the outreach programs. The next is offerings. Offerings are voluntary gifts. They are above and beyond the tithe. The biblical foundation for this, or uh, it's actually mentioned in 2 Corinthians 9, 7, which says, Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Now, what I'll tell you is a lot of people, they, when, they're, you know, when they're trying to beat themselves, worm, you know, worm, wiggle their way out of the tithe, is they're like, oh, no, 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 this, this, is, this is tithing, this 2 Corinthians, uh, a cheerful giver. I can give what I feel like, and I feel like giving 1% that makes me cheerful. That's not scriptural. I mean, this, I've just given you the Bible, and I'm giving you facts. So uh, this, is, this is the truth. Offerings can be designated uh, the purpose for, for specific things. Um, with the building campaign, or, or when, when uh, we had a group going to uh, Brazil for the Mirror's Missions, and they would give specifically for that. Um, that's what the difference in, a, in an offering is. And what I'll tell you is that you do not, you do not get to exchange offerings in replace of tithes. So people, oh, I'm giving a gift. I know, but you don't tithe. But I want to give a gift. <laughs> I'm like, all right, that's between you and the Scripture. But, but I just want you to understand that the difference is. And then there's the extravagant offerings. And these are offerings that are significant, not necessarily in the dollar amount, or, or the, but it's, it's often sacrificial. They're sacrificial gifts that go beyond the regular tithes and offerings. A great example is, because a lot of people think, well, extravagant. Why don't I, got, I don't have that kind of money. Well, let me tell you what kind of money qualifies or quantifies as an extravagant giving. Let's go to, um, let's go to Mark 12, 41, 44, the widow's offering. Jesus sat near the collection box in the temple and watched as the crowds dropped, money, uh, dropped in their money. Many rich people put in large amounts. And then a poor widow came and dropped in two small coins. This is the NLV, the other translation, two mites, two small coins. 
Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has given more than all the others who were making contributions. For they give a tiny part of their surplus. But she, poor as she is, has given everything she had to live on. Like that's faith. That's extravagant. That is extravagant. And these offerings, the practical purpose, application, they're usually given out out of deep gratitude, out of deep faith, a desire to make a substantial impact. And and each of these types of giving, um, what they do is they represent a different level of commitment and sacrifice. But all are acts of worship and all trust in God's provision. So let's walk through this. Let's walk it out a little bit. What's important to understand is is to give either or all three requires becoming equipped uh, to become a healthy steward. Foundation for living, the foundation for living a best blessed life, it walks on two legs of stewardship and generosity. To live your best blessed life as a healthy steward, as a healthy manager of God's resources, it walks on two legs. Stewardship and generosity. Remember, stewardship, it's managing the resources that God's entrusted to you. We've talked about this. God is the owner. God owns everything. How do we know? Well, Scripture tells us. Deuteronomy 10.14 says, uh, To the Lord your God belongs the heavens, even the highest heavens, the earth, and everything in it. Isn't that beautiful, the way the Holy Spirit... Uh, Just what what Asafe was just saying, those precious gems, a diamond, I've never seen a diamond tree. They are in the earth, which requires faith, digging, perseverance, like Joe said, and effort. How else do we know? Haggai 2.8, the silver is mine, the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. Now he's not boasting and he's not bragging. He's just declaring truth. It is his. Thank you, Lord, that it's yours. And he gives it to us. He gives us to us to do what? To manage it. The Bible teaches us that we are stewards of God's resources. We are the managers. And also I want to throw in there a little lanyard. That's free. That means free. Extra down in the body in Cajun. Um, let's also remember our relationships. Our spouses. It is re- it's our responsibility to steward those relationships well. So we know this because oh, 1 Peter 4.10 says, Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. It could be money. It could be prayers. It could be anointing gifts, spiritual gifts of the Holy Spirit. It could be your, your spouse, your family, your relationships. In the, various, in the various forms that God gives us these blessings, we are to be faithful stewards. You know, as we take steps into stewardship and generosity, God comes in and supernaturally blesses you according to your ability. We've talked about this before. With each step, you find yourself blessed to give even more. One thing that we've learned in our personal lives, Lee, and I, you cannot outgive God. You cannot outgive God. But, like we've said before, when people are like, well, I hadn't seen anything. Well, when God can trust to give through you, then God will give to you. It doesn't do the kingdom or anybody any good to have a big fat bank account stored up of God's blessings. It's like, what are you going to do with it? I'm just going to hold on to it just in case. That's not not the principle. It's not the concept. God will give to you based on your ability. Uh, This is for protection. This is for protection. It's not like we talked about the parable of the five talents. It's like, well, that don't sound fair. He should give everybody the same thing. Well, let me tell you, don't give me a million dollars because I'm not good with money. Now give it to my wife and she's going to steward it well. Maybe buy me a new pair of loafers. I've been wearing these out. But, but God gives according to our ability. We know this from Matthew 25, 14, 15. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man. This is so important. Jesus is telling, just like Asafe said, you would have thought we coordinated this. The kingdom of heaven is like... That is a comparative compound word. You don't have to guess what the kingdom of heaven is. 
It's so mysterious. I don't know nothing. You don't know nothing because you don't read the Word. When Jesus is saying the kingdom of heaven is like, He's about to tell you what it's like. You want to unlock the mysteries? It's like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one. To each according to what? His own ability. And immediately he went on a journey. Now remember this. Each to his own ability. Like God is stewarding us the way we're to steward his resources. He is protecting us. He is growing us. If he gave us a calling and our character had not grown into being able to carry that calling, we'd get crushed. We would get crushed. I give you the example all the time about uh, uh, 73% of people who have won multi-million dollar lotteries are bankrupt within three years. Why? Because they had not developed the character, the skill set to carry the calling, and they got crushed because of it. God is protecting us. That, that person, that uh, servant with the one talent, they could have stewarded it well. When the master came back and he'd given maybe double plus one, he would have increased the amount. It is protection. It is not punishment. There you go. Amen. So the Bible emphasizes that those who are faithful with what they have have been given and will be entrusted with more. And that's no secret. The principle is highlighted in several passages. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 9, uh, 6 through 8. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. There is a, there is a if this, then that relationship. That is a computer logic model, if this, then that. If you sow this way, then you will reap this way. You're not just going to sow one little seed on hard ground and reap a, reap a harvest. Well, I lucked out on that one. Boy, karma was with me. Well, maybe so. That just means it was the devil. It wasn't from the Lord. It doesn't mean that you're stewarding and you're reaping appropriately. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at, that time, at all times, having all that you need, you will be abound in every good work. Like, isn't that amazing? Like, think back to different times in your life where maybe you just started a new job and you knew just how dumb the boss was, how little to nothing they knew. On your first day, look, when I was a rookie cop and they sent me out there, oh, man, a friend of mine would sit and we'd talk for hours about what we'd do if we were the sheriff on our first day. I didn't even know the streets in that big parish. I didn't even know the county and the other places. That was in Louisiana. Thank God that he protected me from giving me too much. Now, you know what? I did eventually rise up to be a commander and then a chief of police. And I knew those rookies that just graduated the academy were sitting out somewhere hiding under a tree, not patrolling streets, talking bad about me. But that was okay because I'd been there. And my job was to raise them up, to steward them in their relationships. I want you to think about times when we've been there too. The Lord is protecting us. He is covering us. He is preparing us so that we are good in all times and all things. So let's talk about offerings. So we've already covered the tithe. What I want to do is, um, which is bringing back to God what he first gave us. And remember, I think it's important that when we phrase this, we do it scripturally, but to bring back. You don't pay back. You don't give back to God what he first gave to you. So it's important. This is what the tithe is. We've covered it for five weeks. It's bringing back to God what he first gave us. So let's look at offerings. Offerings are voluntary gifts. Voluntary gifts that are given above and not in place of your tithes. And it's like, well, why do you keep focusing on the tithe? Because that's the foundation of everything. That is the foundation of good stewardship. That is the foundation. If, the, if, the, if, the, if law enforcement or the state, which they do, and they say, you've got to take driver's ed, you've got to be this age, you've got to get your license, and you've got to have car insurance to get on the road, that is the foundation. Now, once you get on the road, you're free to go wherever you want to go that you can legally be. You can go eat, or you can go to the movies, or you come to church, you do whatever you want to do. But none of that happens 
Your mobility does not happen until you've satisfied the foundational basis. No matter how fancy of your car you chose to drive or wherever you go on vacation, it all begins with the basic foundation of tithing. So offerings can be designated for specific needs, like we said, uh, missions, building funds, or helping those in need. That's really the beauty and the joy of offerings is that, you know, one time the Lord had told us years ago, he said, I'm going to give you an opportunity to steward a gift. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. For eight months, I waited. And he said, okay, I want you to do it now. And I will tell you that it was a, it was a significant amount that Lee and I prayed and we came into agreement on. And, 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 I, and I gave it to the church that we were attending. And, and man, immediately I saw that it was wasted. It was misspent. And I was so angry at that pastor. I was very angry at the pastor. And I was talking to a mentor of mine. And I'm like, well, you know what? I mean, the Lord said I get to steward it. He goes, did you steward it? Well, I put it in the plate. I didn't put it in the plate. It was a check. And I said, well, what control do I have? Or what do I? He goes, was that an offering? Yeah. He said, you failed to steward You see, God gave you an opportunity to steward, and you failed. And he said, but you didn't really fail. I'm like, yeah, but you don't know what they did with that money. He goes, did you learn your lesson? Yeah. Bam. Then you succeeded. This is the beauty of offerings, is to dedicate it to something where your heart is found. So our obedience to a holy God is, and remember, the giving is what redeems us through the first offering, through the offering of the first fruit. Our first fruit redeems the giving of what redeems the rest. The Lord wants to know that your heart is attached in obedience, not obligation or compulsion. Romans 11, 16 tells us, For if the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. You see, everything has got to start with a righteous first offering. So let's go to extravagant offerings. As I said, sometimes people are like, oh my gosh, I don't have that kind of money. I don't have that. (laughs) And so I wanted to start off with the two mites to show you that the extravagance is not in the amount. It's in the heart. It's in the intention and the purpose. You see where your heart, where's your heart on this topic? You know, is it of, of big sacrificial generosity? Like some people, it's just like, "Mm, no, that ain't me. That ain't me. Well, that's the test. That's the test to see where your heart is. Do you have a generous heart or maybe a a selfish heart? If just the mere mention, if just, and I've had conversations with people over the years, if just the mere mention of extravagant giving puts a knot in your gut, your gut's not the problem. It's where's your heart? It's where's your heart? So I want to give you another example of generous giving. It's going to come from John 12, 1, 8. And we'll read this. Uh, It's the anointing at Bethany. Then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus, who, uh, who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead, there they made him a supper and Martha served. And Lazarus... Uh, was one of those who sat at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This he said, and I love John, this he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a what? He was a thief. He was a thief and had the money box, and he used to take what was put in it. But Jesus said, let her alone. She has kept this for, this, uh, for me on my day of burial. For the poor you will have with you always, but me you do not have always. See, that's extravagant giving. That is extravagant giving. So there's two questions that come in my mind with this example. Why did she want to give such a generous gift to the Lord? And the other question is, why did it bother Judas so much? What's it his business? It's not his. 
You see, two hearts are revealed in this one passage. A generous heart and a selfish heart. You see, what's interesting is how the giving of a gift, money, material, monetary, how that gift or, or that giving reveals both hearts. This is the nature of the offering, of the tithe. It is meant to reveal your heart. Not to condemn you, but prayerfully to convict you. You see, selfishness is the enemy of generosity. It is the enemy of generosity. So I ask, how much do you, how much do you think constitutes an extravagant gift? I mean, especially when God owns it all. Like, think of heaven. It has gold streets and diamond walls and pearly gates. They go 1,380 miles high. See, Mary gave oil that was worth one year's wages. And he poured it on, she poured it on the feet of Jesus. 300 denarii, it's a plural of denarius, we hear that often. She poured out one year's salary on Jesus' feet. So I looked and I was curious. In 2023, the average American income, the average, was $48,060. So 300 uh, denarii was equal to one year of her wages. Like, can you? We'll put away our, our hyper, hyper religious hats. I just want to, can you imagine buying perfume or cologne and spending $48,000 on it? Now, Leah's not here, but I bet you she could. <laughs> y'all, don't, y'all don't tell her Sunday. But really, can you imagine buying something, perfume or cologne, worth $48,000 and then pouring it on someone's feet? I mean, she didn't, she, didn't even, she didn't even get to dab a little bit behind her ears, put a little bit on her wrists, do that axe body spray with the young boys who psh, and walk through it. Everything. Remember, the other scripture, she broke the top off the flask. She didn't even save the, the screw top to keep a little for herself. She went all in in pouring out. Did Jesus see this as a waste? Or was he looking at her heart? Do you think that there's anything that we could give that would impress the owner of the universe? Well, the most extravagant gift we can give is ourselves. You see, 2 Corinthians 8, 5 tells us, and not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. You are the most precious thing that you can give back to the Lord. Your heart is the most precious thing that you can give to the Lord. He owns everything. He just wants your heart. And money is the thermometer that is used to measure the temperature of your heart towards God. Where does that thermostat sit? So if money that doesn't love you Money has, no, money has no care. It will walk out of your wallet, not even send you a text. If that causes any hesitation from fully giving your heart to God, then it's a great opportunity to learn and to reassess and really pray to the Lord that, that in that conviction that he will show you how to move in faith. I always love it back in Mark when the dad, his son was demon-possessed and being thrown into the fire. He was probably one of the most honest people outside of Jesus, obviously. I believe. But help my unbelief. This is what God's doing by teaching us how to be good stewards. Whatever your level of unbelief is at this point, God's helping you in your unbelief by simply giving you Scripture. Giving you Scripture. So let's go to Matthew 26, 13. I tell you the truth. Wherever the good news is preached throughout this world, this woman's deeds will be remembered and discussed. You want to talk about an honor, a testimony? I mean, this this is Jesus. I'll tell you the truth. Wherever the good news is preached throughout the world, 
this woman's deed will be remembered and discussed. And how do we know that that's true? Because we're doing it right now. Because we're doing it right now. Let your testimony, let your acts of giving and faithfulness become your testimony that is spoken for generations. You see, God always rewards giving with the right heart. What a powerful testimony for Mary. Like, are we willing to give him everything? Or is there a level that you're going to have to stop at? And you know you don't know until, you, until you're willing to step to that point. Until you move to that point. So I want to give you some other examples of, of big giving, extravagant giving in Scripture. And if we look at David's gift to the temple, it would equal $21 billion today. Solomon offered 1,000 sacrifices to God. The widow's two mites were definitely an extravagant gift because she gave all she had. You see, it's not the amount that matters. It's the attitude behind the amount. I mean, Abraham offered his son. And ultimately, so did God. So I want to take a little time. I call this a time for activation. And I want you to just take a couple minutes and just ask the Holy Spirit, like, what are you saying to me about living the life of a healthy steward? And I do. I pray that the, that the Holy Spirit, that you'll, be, that you'll be open to receive a word. I know what we all want to hear. Good job. Good job. Well done, good and faithful servant. But I do. I challenge you. We've been through six weeks of scriptural teaching on being a healthy steward. I know I've been convicted. You can't go deeper. You can't go deeper. And I'm not just talking about how much you give, or I'm talking about what you give back to the Lord. What oil are you willing to pour out on the feet of Jesus? So that brings us to this. Congratulations for completing this class, Healthy Stewardship. I used to speak at police academy graduations all the time, and after 22 weeks and whatever they go through, it was such a joy, and college graduations. But to me, this is exciting. We have, we have spent, we have invested wisely. We have been good stewards of our Wednesday nights and invested them in this class. And for that, we have graduated from this class. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Thank you all so much. So, as we like to do for our equipping ceremony, uh, our, our series, we like to celebrate. So next week is going to be a night of worship and pizza. So those who didn't come to the class, don't tell them. Because <laughs> everybody invariably shows up for the pizza party. So, uh, But no, it'll be a great time to invite folks just for worship and pizza. And, and we'll start talking about the series that's coming up after that. So uh, if we could stand and, and let me pray over this and then... And then we'll dismiss. We want to be good stewards of time. I know worship's going to, going to rehearse. So Lord, our Father God, we love you. We praise you. We are so, so grateful. Thank you for, for, a, mm, thank you for this series. Mm. It is so beautiful to see the tangible manifestation of, the, of, your, of your word. Early in the year, you put this on my heart. And you said, this is when I need it done. And this is why I want it done. And this is how you're going to do it. And I thank you for that, Lord. For months and months and months, I prayed and prepared. And then to be able to go through the, the physical application of sharing this message. And Elder Joe helped in the third week. It is so good to see our yeses become tangible fruit. And this is good fruit. This is good fruit. And I pray, Father Lord, that, that, that the Mm, that the seeds of healthy stewardship will bear abundant provisions in, in their lives, in the life of this church, in the purpose and impact of this church, but in their individual lives, Lord. I pray abundance over these, over these healthy stewards. 
I pray an abundance of provision in their joy, in their peace, even in their long suffering, but in their, in their financial provisions and in their marital provisions and their familial provisions. In all they do, Lord, I pray your favor. I pray your favor over these healthy stewards. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We praise you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you all so much.